All right, 10.50, good morning. I think it's morning. My name is Huynh Tuet Dow. I am absolutely thrilled to be here with y'all. I'm an Android developer at Trello. I think the other guy beforehand might have been as well. Uh, and I'm here to talk to y'all today about custom views. I absolutely love custom views. They're one of my favorite things about doing Android, and you could probably call me a custom view uh, fangirl. Now, you might say to yourself, why would I ever need to do a custom view? There's so many awesome platform widgets and views and layouts, why would you ever want to do your own custom view? Well, there's a few different reasons. Say you have a design application where you're trying to do something really unique, really new, some kind of new interaction or some kind of new like um, just way of doing an application, and you can't find a way to express that new interaction, that new UI in the current Android platform widgets. You might need some custom views for that. Say you have a UI that's very complex, that might be very nested, that just has a lot going on, and you want to practice good software design, and you want to make it more, perhaps more modular, break that down into more kind of handleable pieces, or maybe you just have a UI that has a lot of kind of repeated elements, like maybe some forms, things like that, and you want to make that code a little more reusable. Custom views can help you with that. And maybe you have problems with performance. Uh, think again about a layout that is very complex, that's super nested, depending on your situation, depending on how dense maybe data that you're displaying is, or just other factors, you might end up with a janky UI or some scroll performance problems. Custom views can also help you with that as well. Um, and, you know, I'm a custom view fangirl. I tend to use them a little bit more than I have to. And there are times when they are wonderful solutions, but there are some times when they're not great solutions. And there are, I guess, cons to using custom views. So number one and number two is that custom views are super time consuming to, to develop and that they're extremely difficult. You're gonna be working with some kind of like a slightly lower level kind of elements of the Android platform, and it just takes a long time to get them right. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that when you're using the Android platform widgets and layouts, you, you get a lot for free. You get a lot of great interactions and um, animations and all kinds of like functionality just out of the box, but all of that great stuff you don't get with custom views. You have to do it yourself. Things like the drawing you probably will end up doing yourself. Things like making sure that all the interactions are the, the way that you want. And things like accessibility you will have to do on your own with custom views. So again, they might not always be the, great, the greatest solution for you, but if you do Android long enough, I'm, I'm almost willing to bet that you will, ha you will have to think about doing custom views at some point. So what I want to do today during this talk is to kind of talk about custom views in a very kind of fundamental level. I want to talk about how Android draws views and how that process works and how you can tap into that to create your own custom views. Now, there's a lot of different ways of going custom, and we'll talk about a few of them today. And I just kind of want to give you an idea of how you can get started with custom views and view groups. And we're going to talk about three things, which you can kind of guess from the title of my talk. We're going to talk about something called measure, something called layout, and something called draw, and how those fit into the world of custom views. And we're also going to talk about custom view groups in particular, because while view groups are views, they kind of have a few kind of special things going on with them when you're creating custom views. All right, so let's talk about how Android draws views. So your activity hierarchies, your layouts, all start out with these XML files, right? Or generally they do. And there's a few steps in a process that has to happen before that XML layout gets drawn on the screen. So the first thing that has to happen is that XML layout has to be inflated, has to be instantiated. All those views come to life basically inside of your application. And when they are instantiated, they form this tree, this view hierarchy of interconnected parent and child views. So once that view hierarchy, once that layout comes to life, it exists inside of your application, it's not quite ready yet. There are three things that have to happen before that layout ends up on the screen. And those three things are measure, layout, and draw. Now, each of these phases is basically a depth first traversal of this tree, this view hierarchy. And each phase kind of does something particular to the view hierarchy to get it ready to be drawn. Now, there are actually three methods for you as Android developers to hook into this process and implement your own kind of custom behavior and, and um, logic. And these three methods are on measure, on layout, and on draw. 
Now, what happens in the measure phase in this on-measure method is that what happens is that starting from the root and going from parent to children, each parent figures out some constraints, some limitations on the size that each of its children can be, and it passes those constraints to each child. And in the process, the child will kind of take those constraints, look at its content, and figure out how big it wants to be. It's measured width and height, as they are called. And then what happens is the child, once it figures out that desired width and height, will take that value and store it in itself. Now, in this process, the child might have children of its own, so it'll probably, um, if it does have any children, we'll ask each of those children to kind of do the same, figure out their measured width and height, and then take those into account when it's, when that, when it's um, calculating its measured width and height as well. So it's this recursive process down and down and down the line until everyone gets measured and figures out how big they want to be. Now, in layout, again, step first traversal, so it's starting from root and going from parent to children. In layout, each parent will decide the final size and position of each child on the screen. And finally, once everything's been measured, measured and once everything's been laid out, then everything can be drawn. And what happens is, again, starting from parents and going to children, each parent view will draw itself and then go to each child and request that each child does the same. Now, an interesting side effect of this is that because the parent draws first, it basically ends up on the bottom. So when the parent draws and then asks its children to draw, the children are drawn on top of that parent. So that's basically the whole Android view drawing process. So let's talk about custom views. So there's a lot of different ways of doing it, and which one you pick kind of decides on the needs of your application and kind of like how far you're willing to go, basically. There's a really great article written by Lucas Rocha at Facebook called Custom Layouts on Android. And he talks about three different ways of going custom. I want to talk about those three ways that Lucas talks about, and then I'm going to throw in one of my own. So we're going to split it up by views and view groups. And so let's talk about views first. So my very first like foray into doing custom views was with extending edit text. So I had this application I was working on, and I think we had to like support all the way down to gingerbread or something. And it was a shopping application and there was like some pin forms and some other things where we had to enter in like, you know, kind of like um, secure numbers. And we really wanted to do everything kind of efficiently. So there was really great input types, right, for pin passwords. But those input types, those input type like attributes in XML weren't supported all the way down to gingerbread. And we didn't want to have to start sticking Java code all over the place just to get these like edit text set up. So what I ended up doing was extending edit text and then doing all that Java code inside of that extended edit text and just using that everywhere. So if there's something that you don't like about an Android platform widget, you can just tweak it. You can just extend it, override whatever you have to do, and there's your first custom extended view. And it's a really great way to get started kind of playing around with doing your own things in Android. So arguably the simplest way to kind of go about going custom. Now, if you wanted to get even more adventurous, you could do what Lucas calls flat custom views. So before I talked about extending existing platform widgets, well, you can also take that base Android view and extend it and do all the drawing, all of the behavior uh, logic on your own, and that's a totally custom uh, view. And there's a lot of different way, reasons you, could, you would want to do a flat custom view. Maybe you just really, really want to do all of the drawing and all the animating yourself, or maybe you have performance problems. Going, going again back to like the whole idea of performance, a lot of performance problems with views being like really, really complex hierarchies and just having a lot of views or having a lot of nested views. If you can find a way to implement that UI or behavior with a single view that maybe you're doing the drawing yourself, that can actually help you improve performance by making that view hierarchy a little bit flatter, a little bit more simple. So view groups. So in Lucas's article, he talks very specifically about what he calls composite view groups, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. So the idea of doing a composite view group is taking a set of components, grouping them together so that you create a whole different, a whole new component. So the simplest way of doing this is just to take a layout that exists already in Android, linear layout, relative layout, frame layout, whatever you like, and then implementing and taking, a, taking whatever that set of components that you want to group together, sticking in that layout, adding whatever logic you want to kind of you know, set that, that component up, and that's it. That's a custom view group. And you might find yourself thinking about custom, or sorry, composite view groups if you have a really, again, like nested or complex UI that you just want to break down and make it more manageable. 
Or again, if you have like, you know, parts of your application, like that app I was working on before, we had a lot of those forms and a lot of like kind of password entry and all that kind of stuff. And we, we kept having seeing the same design over and over again. You can use a custom composite or sorry, a composite view group in that situation just so you don't have to keep you know copying and pasting the same UI code over and over again. So it's really good for layout reuse as well. And if you find yourself doing composite view groups, but maybe you want to do something a little different. Maybe you want to take that set of components that you're combining together and lay, that, lay them out in a, in a special way. Or maybe you have an existing layout that doesn't quite perform as well as you'd like. You can do a custom composite group. So a custom composite group is where instead of taking an existing layout, like linear layout, relative layout, or what have you, and extending it and sticking some components in there, you instead take the base view group, extend that, implement some methods, and then create your own kind of new custom layout logic with this set of components. And so in those situations where you do want to do something cool, like kind of lay them out in a funky way, or if you do have performance problems where, uh, for example, like relative layout, right? Relative layout is really fun, it's really flexible, it allows you to kind of do interesting things when laying out views, you know, to the left of this view, to the right of that view, up there, down there, in the center. It's really powerful, but it's actually, it can actually be kind of Detrimental, detrimental to performance because relative layout, right out of the box, always requires two passes of measure and layout, those two, uh, those two of the three phases I mentioned before. It always requires two of those. So depending on what your UI looks like, like how much logic you have going on in there, you can actually experience performance problems because of this. So if you do a custom composite view where you're very explicitly laying things out yourself, you can kind of sometimes sidestep some of these little things in the platform. So today, we're just going to go right into doing flat custom and custom composite views. We're going to extend the base view and base view group class in a couple of examples and see how you can do that. So custom views. Now, three methods I mentioned before, on measure, on layout, and on draw. Now, depending on whether you're going to do a custom view or a custom view group, you're going to implement kind of different, different, a different set uh, of these three methods. So for custom views, strictly speaking, all you have to do is implement on draw. And it's pretty easy to see why views need to be drawn. So you need to implement on draw. Um, and again, it's required for the view to appear on the screen. You don't need to implement layout because, strictly speaking, when you're doing flat custom views, there are no children, so there's nothing to lay out. And you don't have to strictly implement on measure either. But I will tell you now that I really, really recommend that you do because there, while there is like basic measure behavior inside of the view class, it's not that great. It works well in some situations, but it's not too flexible. And say you want to do a flat custom view where you want to share it, like maybe you want to add, you, you maybe want to reuse it in your own team, or you want to distribute it as an open source library. Implementing on measure will give you the ability to make that custom view more flexible, more reusable, more adaptable, which is something we always talk about in Android, right? Making sure that our layouts are adaptable. So, if you're doing custom views, I highly recommend that you do implement on measure as well. So I'm going to do a little example for you uh, today. So this is a tally counter. It's one of those things you know that you see people like clicking at turnstiles to count how many people are passing through the gate. Um, I'm an engineer. I am not anything close to resembling a designer. So this is my interpretation of a tally counter on the right. There's like a big pink square background. There's like the count of the counter in big white letters. I threw an orange line in there because I don't know. I just felt like being fancy. And there's some other buttons as well that I'm going to use to interact with this tally counter. Uh, in fact, I actually, because I'm an engineer, I'm overthink, I overthink things. I create an interface for my tally counter where I can reset the counter, increment it, um, get the actual count, and set the, set, directly set the value of the counter. Um, I'm only mentioning this because you'll see it in my example code, so that's what that is. So first step in creating a view, as in creating most classes, is constructors. And in the view base class, you'll see four constructors. And the first constructor that you probably will see is one that takes a single argument, takes a context. This context is the context in which the view lives and is basically how that view will access resources and themes, things like that. And this is the constructor that gets used when you instantiate your view directly in Java code, when you're using that new operator. So the second constructor that you probably will see is one that looks pretty similar, similar to the first one, but it actually adds a second argument. So there's an attribute set in this second constructor. And when your XML layouts are being inflated, um, you know, there's all those attributes that you can set, like background, clickable, uh, you know, text size, all that stuff. 
all of those attribute values, when the XML layout is inflated, end up stored inside of this attribute set. And that is how the view can access any attributes in XML that you set when you're creating, when you're basically um, declaring that view in your XML. Now, there are two more constructors. I'm not going to talk about them today because generally, if you're doing custom views and custom view groups, you don't have to worry about them too much. But um, my esteemed college, colleague, Dan Liu, who just spoke <laughs> about an hour ago, did a great article very recently um, that is a deep dive into Android view constructors. So if you're kind of curious about the stuff that I'm leaving out, please go check, out, check that out. It's a good read. So creating our, view, creating our tally counter view, and here are the two constructors that I have. Uh, the first one, my kind of Java code instantiator, uh, is pretty simple. I'm just calling the second constructor and passing null for the attribute set. Um, all of the fun stuff is in the second one. And so for your flat custom views, a lot of the times, your constructor will just be about setup. So when you're drawing in a custom view, you draw on a canvas. And kind of going with the metaphor, to draw on the canvas, most of the time you'll need a paint object. So a paint object just basically stores different properties that you can apply to drawing operations. So things like fill color, stroke color, stroke width, things like that, they all live in this paint object. So you'll probably end up creating some of them and setting like different color and text values um, on, these, on these paint objects as you're kind of building your flat custom view. There's also an object called text paint. So if you're working with text, the text paint is just an extension of the paint class that just adds in some extra properties for text size, typeface, that kind of thing. And a lot of times you'll find your, you'll, yourself uh, implementing ge ge geometric objects, so things like recs and points. A lot of the canvas drawing operations take these geometric objects as uh, parameters. So like if I'm drawing a rectangle, I kind of feed in this rect object to let the canvas know how big that rect is going to be, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, you'll find yourself kind of instantiating a lot of those in your constructors. And then finally, any other setup that you have to do. So here at the bottom, it's a little, might be a little bit hard to see, but I'm basically setting my counter to zero to initialize it. So this is basically the, the kind of the fun part of my flat custom view, the draw method. So it's pretty straightforward. A lot of it is just taking that canvas object, it, object that gets passed to undraw and then doing stuff to it. So as you can see here, I'm doing some calculations because I want everything to be nicely centered in my tally counter. So I'm calculating the center and I'm calling basically three uh, operations on my canvas. Uh, draw round rect, which will draw that nice pink background that I had. Uh, draw line, which draws that random line that I just threw in my tally counter. And draw text to actually draw the, the count of the tally counter um, on my canvas. And that's pretty much it. And all of those lines of code result in this. Isn't it lovely? And um, so yeah, so with just like that, the, just that few, those few lines of code, just implementing on draw, implementing some constructors, I'm able to create this new custom component that looks as intended. And I actually um, set up a click listener on this button to set the count of my counter. Now, as you can see, it's not incrementing. And I, I, that's the reason I have the toast there, just to prove to you that I wasn't an idiot and I just didn't set the click listener or something like that. Uh, so why is my tally counter, even though I'm calling set count on it, not updating? So the problem is, is that while the state of my tally counter was changing, I didn't update the drawing to reflect that state change. And that's something you're going to have to deal with a lot with custom views, is being able to respond to state changes and reflect them in the drawing. And it's actually really simple to do. So what you do is whenever the drawn state of your view doesn't accurately reflect the actual state of your uh, view, you can call invalidate. And what invalidate does is lets Android know that that view is dirty, that it needs to be redrawn, and it will be redrawn at some point in the future. It won't get redrawn immediately when you call invalidate, but the next time, um, the next time through that a draw, um, pro a, a draw phase happens, it'll get redrawn. Uh, something interesting is that there's actually several variants of the invalidate method. Uh, one of them takes four integers, and these integers defined the left, top, right, and bottom of a bounding box. And what you can do with this variant of invalidate is that rather than saying the whole thing is dirty, you can actually just let Android know that, hey, just this specific portion of my view is dirty and needs to be redrawn. Now, why would you need to do this? Well, drawing is expensive. 
It's like necessary, but it is an expensive operation. And by being more specific, by giving Android hints about what needs to be redrawn, you can actually help it optimize this process. So think about my tally counter, right? Whenever the count changes, it's really just that, port, that box around the number that changes. So what I could do to make it a little more efficient is just kind of figure out a bounding box for my text in my tally counter, and then give that to Android to let, know, let it know, hey, it's just this part of my view that's changing. And again, helping it to, be, to do that whole process a little more efficiently. So back to my counter. Um, all I have to do to get it to work properly is to stick in this call to invalidate inside of my set count method so that once the counts change and I update all whatever properties that I need, I say, hey, um, the views are now, go ahead and validate it. And next time it will get redrawn, it'll look a little more like that. Yay, it's actually counting. So again, every time I'm clicking, um, the count's being set, but then also the view's being invalidated. And then pretty quickly afterwards, um, the view is redrawn to reflect that new count. So, some things to remember in general when you're drawing. Uh, number, one, number one rule is never, ever, ever allocate objects in on-draw. So, on-draw happens a lot, right? So every time state changes, things need to be redrawn. Now, if you imagine just creating an object inside of on-draw, think about how much memory you're going to churn if you just keep creating an object over and over and over and over again when on-draw is called. So, don't ever, ever do it. Lint will actually yell at you if you do any allocations in on-draw, and you should listen to Lint uh, and not do that. That kind of results sometimes, though, in having to be really creative about how you create and change different objects that you need for your drawing. So there's a couple of classes that you can do when you're drawing text. Uh, one's called static layout, one's called dynamic layout. And they're really nice in that if you're drawing text and you want kind of like a lot of the wrapping done for you, static layout and dynamic layout will help you with that. The problem is that you can only set the properties on static layout once. So when you have text that changes sometimes, you're kind of stuck with this idea of like, well, I don't want to implement a new, I don't want to instantiate a new static layout in on draw, but you know, because things get kind of dynamic sometimes, you're not quite sure what to do it. So a lot of times the rule is just instantiate whatever you can in the constructor. Again, creating these like specific instances of these objects that you need to, to, do, to do any kind of drawing, and then just changing properties on them where you can, or just getting creative about how you do things. But that's one of the big challenges. So another thing to remember is that, again, only invalidate when you need and only invalidate what you need. Just to repeat, drawing is expensive, don't do it willy-nilly, your view and your performance will thank you. So another thing that really caught me a lot when I first started doing custom views is how text is positioned. So a lot of times when you're calling drawing operations, these are pretty straightforward, okay? A rectangle's from 0, 0 to 0, X and down to here and it renders how you think. Uh, text is a little bit different. Text, when you give uh, the draw text command or, or other kind of text drawing commands a position, generally everything is positioned at the baseline. So the baseline is that imaginary line that text sits on top of. So you can imagine that if you are kind of drawing text and you're kind of assuming that everything's positioned at the top left corner as we're used to, the text starts kind of like getting positioned a little bit higher than you think. And I, every time I do a new custom view, I always forget this. And then I like run it for the first time and my text is all the way off in the ceiling. So just a little tip uh, from my many mistakes, just don't forget that text is always positioned at the baseline. Um, and finally, when you're doing custom view drawing, you draw in pixels, but you should continue to think in DPs and SPs. So every drawing operation that you do on that canvas is in pixels. But we're Android developers. We've probably had it beaten into our heads a thousand times that we need to be flexible. We need to create uh, adaptable layouts. And that is not, that's, that's continues to be true in custom views. So again, a lot of what you're going to do is you're going to kind of take in measurements, take in like values and DPs and SPs, and you're going to have to do the work yourself of converting those to pixels. But again, still really good to think in DPs and SPs, even with custom views. So my layout that I just showed you has a little secret. There's a button <laughs> underneath the tally counter. And that poor button has just kind of been shoved off in no man's land. And why is that? Well, you might say to me, well, you probably just set match parent on that counter, right? I was like, well, no, I, I didn't. As you can see here from the XML, it's actually wrap content. Uh, the problem is that wrap content doesn't work here because my tally counter view doesn't have a good notion of how big it is. And this is going back to where I asked you to pretty, pretty please implement on measure when you can. Um, and the reason that for that is situation like this. So my tally counter, the content it really is just that text, right? Just that count. And it doesn't need to be so greedy with the space. It only needs just so much uh, room to actually draw that number. 
And so in situations like this where you know, your content does have a specific size, it's really good to implement on measure to give the view a better idea about how big it can be so that it can communicate that to the parent and be laid out a little, a little bit more um, appropriate to what the content is. So let's go ahead and talk about how I can fix this and how I can implement on measure. So it's really interesting, this measurement process, because the way that a view gets measured, it's kind of like a negotiation between the parent and the child. And they have like different ways of communicating what they want to each other. So a child starts out by communicating to, communicating to its parent how it wants to be laid out through layout params. Now, layout params can be done in either XML or Java. They kind of include those really that really familiar layout width and layout height that we always have to specify in our XML layouts. Um, you can also kind of um, instantiate them directly in Java code. So you'll see things like margin layout params or all of the some layout dot layout params, those are all like how the child is able to tell the parent how it wants to be laid out. So at some point, regardless of whether things are done in XML or Java, the child will call set layout params kind of um, so it can describe how it wants to be laid out. And at some point later, the parent will retrieve those values using get layout params. And so the next step is for the parent to calculate what are known as measure specs. Now measure specs are how the parent communicates these size constraints, these, these limitations to, to the child. And a measure spec is really just an integer value that encodes a mode and a size. And these two things together will basically tell a child, hey, you can be at most some size, you can be exactly this size, or hey, you know, no constraints, you can be whatever size you want. So depending on that parent, depending on what the child asked for in its layout params, and depending on that parent and its own like constraints from its parent, the parent will figure out a good measure spec value, a good set of constraints for that child, and then pass them through when it calls measure, the measure method on that child. So the next step takes place when the child actually goes through its own on measure method. And what's going to do is take that measure spec from the parent, take those constraints, look at its content, and figure out how big it wants to be. It's measured width and height. And once it figures that out, it's going to call set measured dimension to store that kind of desired width and height inside of itself. Something really important to note is that when you're implementing your own like custom views and you're implementing on measure, you have to call set measure dimension. It's required. If you don't call it, you'll get a runtime exception. And so basically, whenever the child figure, figures out how big it wants to be, it's going to call set measure dimension. And at some point later, the parent is going to call get measure dimension and get measured height to retrieve those values. So one of the big challenges with getting into doing view measurement is trying to figure out how to reconcile all of these different factors that come into play when views are measured. You know, again, parent has measure specs, like it has measure specs from its own parent, the child has like some like desired like layout parameters. How do you kind of figure all this out? Well, when I first started doing custom views, I just I had no idea. I was trying to like do a lot of logic on my own, but later on I luckily discovered that there are a lot of really awesome methods within the view class itself that can do a lot of that heavy lifting for you. And when you're implementing on measure, something really handy to keep in your pocket is this resolve size method. So resolve size will take a size and generally it'll be taking the kind of desire some kind of content size, some kind of estimation from your child of how big it wants to be. And along with that, it'll take a measure spec from the parent, so either a width measure spec or a height measure spec, and it will resolve these two. It'll find a measure, uh, it'll find a size for that child that is as close as possible to its desired con its content size, its desired size, while still meeting those that those constraints, that measure spec from the parent. Okay, so finally, after all these calculations are done, at some point later during the layout phase, the parent will call uh, layout on the child and it will assign that child a final size and position. And that final size and position of the child can be retrieved by calling get width and get height. So something really important to remember is that a child view will, in general, have two sets of dimensions, uh, the measured width and height uh, that it calculated for itself, and then the final width and height that the parent determines when it does that final layout. Sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're not. It just really depends on your layout. Okay. So let's talk about that method I mentioned earlier, resolve size. So there's a lot, there's, there's a little bit more going on in resolve size than I can talk about. So because it's open source, I copied and pasted resolve size and made my own uh, version of it called reconcile size. But the kind of the important thing to know is kind of this stuff that's going on right here. So this is basically how resolve size works. And again, it's taking into account the parent's mode and size that it gives to the child to kind of like reconcile those two things with the actual kind of size that the child wants to be. So 
say I have a content size that my child gave me, and I have a measure spec from the parent. So what resolve size will do is look at the mode. If the mode is exactly, meaning that the parent has determined a specific size for the child, it just defaults to whatever size that the parent gave you. If the mode is at most, then it actually compares. Is the child's desired size smaller than or within the bounds of the parent size? If it is, great, you can use whatever size the child wanted to be. If not, then you're basically going to default to the parent size again, just to stay within those bounds. And finally, if the mode was unspecified, meaning the child can be whatever size it wants, then yay, you get to use the child size that it passed in. So that is what resolve size looks like on the inside, minus a few things I didn't want to talk about. Um, again, uh, this is called reconcile size because I wanted to show you, show you all a simplified version, but in real life, definitely use resolve size. OK, so this is my on measure method. And um, basically, the gist of it is I'm going to take each, um, each uh, sorry. Um, so basically, the gist of it is the, my, my, the, my, the main focus of my content is the text, is that tally counter count. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to measure that text and add in the padding, whatever padding that you know, might have been specified in XML, add it all together, and that's kind of my desired width and height for my child. I'm going to resolve that size so that it fits the parent constraints, and then call set measure dimension um, to store those kind of desired values inside of that view. Um, something you might note is that um, in the top here, I'm actually measuring not the specific text that I'm trying to display, but I'm measuring kind of a maximum value. And this is kind of like something that comes up a lot when you're doing your own custom views, is that you kind of have to think about edge cases and how those edge cases might affect how your view is rendered. So if I think about my tally counter, um, depending on what typeface it might be, you know, the number, some numbers might be narrower or wider than others. So say like my tally counter just counting up and depending on what number it's showing, that text size might actually kind of like, you know, accordion a little bit. It might be narrower sometimes and wider sometimes. And if I'm always measuring my tally counter by the specific size of the text, it might do this weird like kind of like flickering thing. So in order to make up for that, rather than specifically measuring the text that I'm displaying, I'm going to say, OK, my maximum value is something like, because it has four numbers, it's like 9,999. Um, let me measure that. So that's like. That's a guesstimate about as to the widest that my text can be. And I'm going to use that instead to measure my tally counter. Um, and similarly, for the height, um, height, measuring text height on Android can be a total pain in the butt. And a lot of times, like the methods that you are using to try to specifically measure text won't have the results that you want that, that you're hoping for. A lot of that has to do with typefaces. So a lot of, so you can kind of cheat it by using font metrics. Um, font metrics is an object that just kind of stores different properties about um, a typeface. So here, instead of actually measuring the text height, um, I'm using the top, which is basically how high um, a glyph can be over the baseline in that font, and the bottom, which is how low below the baseline a, a glyph can be in that font, and then using that as a guesstimate. It's always OK to guesstimate in your on measures. Uh, but yeah, that's basically it. That's my on measure method. And just by implementing that, um, what was that, like maybe 20, 30 lines of code, um, as you can see, my tally counter looks way better. It's a lot better size. I even was able to add in some padding there, so I kind of am able to kind of you know give it a little more space if I want to, and it just fits better, and it doesn't push off my poor reset button off into no man's land. So that's how I kind of I always kind of like kind of when I'm doing flat custom views, I always always try to do on measure if possible just to give myself more of this flexibility and this more kind of like it didn't just make sense, you know, like having your view properly wrap the content. Okay. So let's go through view groups really quick. Um, even though I um, know everyone loves my sexy tally counter, let's talk about view groups. So view groups are a bit different than doing custom views. So the methods that you have to implement when you're doing a custom view are a little bit different than doing custom views. You do have to implement on measure, and this is because, um, how much time do I have left? OK. So you do have to implement measure um, because that parent has to call measure on each child in order to get it to figure out it's uh, measured width and height. Um, you do have to on, implement on layout because it's abstract, so you have to implement it for your code to compile. But furthermore, you have to be able to, ha to have that parent call layout on each child. Um, if you don't call layout on the child, it ends up being in position 0, 0 with 0 width and 0 height. So it ends up off in 0, 0 non-dimensional space or something. So that's really important. Um, and finally, you actually don't have to implement on draw. And in fact, view groups, the base view group does not draw by default. There's actually a flag called set will not draw that is true um, by default. Um, and it kind of makes sense. View groups are kind of focused on positioning and grouping. 
Um, but if you do feel like you need to draw in your view group, uh, don't forget to set will not draw to false. So I'm going to switch examples a little bit. And this is something we see in Android all the time, the handy old icon with a title and a subtitle. Um, it's kind of a trivial example because you could, you probably are just like, you could do that with a relative layout. You, would, you certainly can. Um, but when you're getting into custom views, and especially custom view groups, it's always good to get your feet wet with really simple examples. Like with this particular layout with the icon, title, and subtitle, it's really easy to describe in code where things need to go, right? Well, the icon is leftmost, the title is to the right of it, the subtitle is to the right of the icon and below the title. Just it's really straightforward. So a great way to practice getting into this like business with the on measure and on layout is to use a really straightforward example and just try to see if you can get it to look um, like like you want. So um, this is what it ends up looking like when you're using a custom composite view. Um, as you can see, it looks pretty much like you would think it would look if you had like a relative layout or some other layout in there. Um, I just had to replace like the root tag with my simplest item um, as opposed to using a relative layout or something like that. And just really quickly, here's just like the constructor part. Um, it's, a cu it's a custom composite view, so I already have a few views that I'm expecting to have. Um, again, because I'm combining a few smaller components into a new component. So I have my uh, icon view, my title view, my subtitle view, and uh, my constructors down there. So something that comes up with view groups is layouts, layout parameters. And it's really interesting um, that when you're extending the view group, um, it uses this view group .layout params class by default. Now, it's cool, but the sucky part is that view group .layout params does not um, does not recognize margins. There's a margin layout params class that also lives inside a view group um, called, uh, but it actually, but view group doesn't use it, and it, it just lives in there, and it, it requires you to kind of turn it on. And so, if you are creating your own custom view group and you find that your margins aren't working, it might be because you didn't turn on, uh, in effect, margin layout params. And you know, you might be creating a custom view group where you might want to add some kind of cool setting or some, some kind of cool modes. Like think about linear layout and think about doing weights. Um, the layout weight is actually encoded inside of the ch children's uh, layout parameters. So if you want to do something cool like that and add your own little twist to things, um, custom layout parameters might be something you want to do. And in order to get them to work, um, it takes four methods that you have to implement. Um, the first one is a validation method called check layout params. It basically looks at a child inside of the parent and sees that layout params, the layout params that exist inside that child are valid. So, so I'm a relative layout um, and I look at my child, but my child has linear layout params. Um, that would fail the check layout params. So that's all that method is doing, just making sure that the child has the correct type of parameters. And so the next three methods that you need to implement are basically about generating layout parameters. Um, there's a method for generating default ones if the child just doesn't happen to have any to begin with. Um, there's a method for generating good layout params from bad ones. So say you have that child that came home with the wrong kind of layout params. Um, there probably is still some information in those bad layout params that you can use, like width and height, things like that. So this method will actually take um, those kind of invalid layout params and try to generate some good ones out of them. And finally, there's a generate layout params that basically use that attribute set. So using those attributes that got, um, that got stored from the um, layout inflation and whatever kind of layout attributes are in there, um, those pull that, those out so that your view group can access them. So another thing that really just kind of, again, like a lot of doing view groups and, and views and this measuring and layout, it just trying to coordinate all of these different kind of factors is really like difficult. And I think that's what really intimidated me when I first started doing view groups, and that's what really got me tripped up. When something just didn't quite lay out the right way, it was a lot of it was just me trying to do everything on my own and missing like missing edge cases or just missing like handling this particular mode or this particular combination. And there's methods in the view group base class that can help you with that. Um, so there's measure child, which basically takes layout params, takes um, the parent's measure specs, and kind of just puts all together for you and cranks and, and basically calls measure on the child with the right measure specs and, again, meeting all the correct constraints. Um, there's measure children, which basically calls measure child and each single child inside the view group. Um, if you want to take margins into account, there's a version of that method called measure child with margins that basically does, does all the work of um, adding in the margins for you. And if you kind of want to just do some of that child measuring on your own because you have something very particular that you want to do, but you still want a little bit of help, 
say you want to figure out a good measure spec for a child, um, there's a get child measure spec that, again, takes into account the parent's own constraints and takes into account the child's constraints and cranks out a really good measure spec for it. So here's my actual simple list item. Um, here's four methods that I implemented to, so that I could use margin layout uh, params. As you can see, it's super simple. They're each one liners, so not too much sweat there. And this is my on measure method. Now, it looks like a lot of code, um, but it's not too bad. And again, because I have a layout here that's pretty simple to explain like the layout of, um, I can do it pretty simply. So basically, I'm taking my icon view, I'm measuring it, I'm passing, it, passing in like the parent measure spec, and I'm all, I've also got some other counter variables that let me keep track of you know, how much width I've used, so that might be left for the children that I'm measuring later, and similarly for the height. And that's all that really is. And basically, once I kind of have this timer, this tally counter view, rather, figuring out how big it wants to be, I kind of do the very familiar resolving size, passing that in with the parent's measure specs, calling set measure dimension to store it, and then what I get at the end is just you know like uh, a nicely measured uh, view group, and then this is on layout. And again, looks like a lot of code, but it's pretty straightforward. It's literally just figuring out where each thing needs to go, calculating the x and the y, and then just calling layout on that particular uh, child with the right um, position and size. So I'm gonna hurry up and crank through real quick. Um, but that's what it looks like at the end. Um, this was done totally with my simple list item, um, and I did all of the layout by myself. And as you can see, um, this wasn't too bad. And it's a really good exercise for you to kind of get into and to kind of practice uh, when, you, when you're trying to do custom view groups. All right, so going to wrap up real quick. Um, doing custom views is a wonderfully deep hole, and you could probably like look at every single facet to doing custom views and doing a, a whole talk on each of those facets. Um, just really quickly, some people that you should follow if you're interested in custom views and view groups. Um, Kelly Schuster, who did the amazing uh, talk yesterday um, about how Android is for everyone, is an awesome person to uh, follow if you're interested in accessibility, which you should care about when you're doing custom views. Uh, Philip Bro, who actually is also talking this year, did a great talk last year about the touch system. So um, when you're doing custom views, if you want to add your own interactions, you should definitely check out Phil's talk. Um, if, you're talk if you want to work with custom drawables, um, that's one of my favorite things to do with custom views. Um, Ryan Harder and Marcus Paulo Souza de Messina, who was also talking at DroidCon, um, did some really great uh, talks on custom drawables. If you're really interested in doing and playing around a lot with the canvas, um, Romain Guy, um, I've been following his blog since I started Android, and I still go back and read his own old, old blog post. He knows just an intense amount um, about how all of that works. Um, Chugi Chan, who um, is also a GDE and a friend of mine, and we also run a YouTube channel together, quick plug. Um, she does some really great blog, uh, blog posts on using filters and shaders and different paths, so kind of advanced drawing stuff. And if you kind of have become, you feel like you're pro level at custom views, but you want to get more performance, you're going to start wanting to look into hardware acceleration um, and thinking about like software layers versus hardware layers and looking into display lists. Um, a. Eugenio Marletti, who works at Clue, um, which is an amazing app that has a crap ton of custom view work. Um, he knows a lot about the subject, has, has, has come up with some really brilliant ideas for solving different view problems, um, and he's an awesome guy to follow. And finally, I just encourage you to go custom, really. Like, Understanding how some of this view drawing works, actually playing with these kind of like methods and like poking at things will not just like give you a means to an end, will help you solve problems in your applications, but just kind of make you a better Android developer, just understanding how these things work. And it'll help you kind of like figure things out and how to implement things and how to debug things. And hopefully I haven't run too over. Thank you so, so very much. I'll probably take questions afterwards, but um, thank you all very much. Follow me on Twitter, ask me questions, bug me. All right, sorry, thanks.